thank you so much. So, let's see if we can get this started. So, water is a necessity for all of us living on this planet. We have carried water, like the girl in that photo, for the past 50,000 years. Yet, hundreds, or at least 100 million people do so still today. Now, just a few years ago, someone came up with this solution for the problem, how to transport water. I know most of us in here think that innovation equals high-tech software, AI, IoT, blockchain, and all the other buzzwords. But innovation can be anything, and innovation happens anywhere. And this is a problem, or an opportunity, depending on how we see it. Everybody agrees in regards to the importance of innovation. OECD, every country, UN, everybody in this room, large corporations, small companies, everybody try to be innovative. And if we're not, then in 12 years, this will be the reality for hundreds of millions of people. So to solve problems, humans innovate. That's what we've always done, and that's what we need to do now to solve the issues ahead. So who am I? Well, right now I'm working for the United Nations, uh, but I have 20 years experience from the private sector, and I've been sitting at every chair at the table at the innovation ecosystem. In 1999, I was sitting under a sewing machine in that pavilion that got totaled in the Salt Lake City tornado. And I was screaming, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. In 1997, I built an insurance platform for the Scandinavian companies in Brazil to basically solve their medical insurance issues. And in 2001, anyone in here who skis or snowboards, I came up with the idea of actually placing that pocket on the arm of the jacket. Now, what is innovation? And this is, this is actually important. We think that we know what it is, but it means a lot of different things to different people, sadly. So if you are riding, or you're not riding a bike, but you're watching people riding a bike, and then you learn how to ride a bike, does that make you an innovator, or is that just copy and paste? Now, today we tend to call things that are equal to learning how to ride a bike from watching others, innovation. Basically, anyone running a Microsoft update on their computer can have the word innovation in their title, sadly. So, uh, in my view, applying existing technology, learning from others, or applying an existing process is not really innovation. It's change management, and we should call it that. Now, I don't know if you can read the names here, but I don't know how many in this room knows who Alan M. Tash is. Hands up. Anyone who knows who Alan M. Tash is? Not a single hand. Anyone here heard about the company Google? Anyone using Google? Yeah, there's a few hands here. Yeah. So Alan M. Tash is the guy who actually invented the search engine. And no one has ever heard of him because he's not Google. He didn't start Lucos, he didn't do the Yahoo search, but he's the guy who actually invented it. Mark Zuckerberg, I think everyone in this room knows, right? The founder of Facebook. What is the innovation height in Facebook? They were like, maybe they are number 1,000 of the SNS services that were launched. Not an early entry at all. And that is symptomatic. If you come up with something that hasn't been done before, you're taking a tremendous risk. Most likely, you will not make it. If you're being the disruptor, you have to create a new market, you have to change the way people think, hence, you're taking maybe 80% of the business risk if you're the first one into that market. And hence, you're very, very likely to fail. So from an investor perspective, it's much safer to be an early adapter than to be an innovator. It's much safer to 
bet on something that is already existing than to actually support something that is new. Tim Berners-Lee, anyone who heard that name? There's a few, that's good. The guy who came up with the World Wide Web. Jack Carpenter. No. So Jack Carpenter is the, uh, is the, um, is the rule exception, exception of the rule. He was a surfer in California, and he thought it was kind of boring that he couldn't do that on snow. So he built the first snowboard in his garage. The cost was $150, and he could only sell them for 80 bucks. Now he has started the company Burton, and they control 80% of the market of snowboards. So that's a disruptor who actually managed to keep the market. But still, he's sort of unknown. Now, why does it matter, the macro perspective on innovation? Well, it matters because everyone in here has one or two things in common. We're all going to die one day, and we all pay tax. And government and governments spend a lot of our tax money in efforts to promote and support innovation. And that's good, because someone has to take the early risk. Otherwise, we will not get these new disruptive ideas funded, because as investors, we're too scared. We don't want to bet our money on that. So the government should, because that's the only way you can create a new Silicon Valley. You can't create a new Silicon Valley in China or in Japan or in Sweden, it doesn't work. Silicon Valley was created organically, and hence they are dominating the IT industry. So if you want to create something similar, you have to do something that hasn't been done before, where there is no epicenter yet. And that's the role of the government, because that creates growth, and growth creates a future. But to do that, we need to agree on a definition. Now, governments like Norway, Sweden, Japan, even though we spend a lot of tax money on this, there is very little outcomes. There's only one country in the world who have dared to look at outcomes, and that's Norway. Norway spend $1 billion a year on innovation. And they looked at a 10-year history on that spending, so $10 billion spent. And there were no outcomes. So zero outcomes on $10 billion. Now you might think that, oh, but that's just one country. No, it's the same every country you look at, just that no one dares to actually dive into it and, and present the data. But if you look at the data, it's quite the same everywhere. It's incremental at best. So, and that is one reason why that is happening is because we have no comprehensive definition of the word innovation. One country study, Sweden, <laughs> they even suggested that we widen the definition so that the word innovation includes everything. That's great. That would improve the data. Every company started would be in innovation. That's perfect. So that's an issue. So the definition that academia used today for the word innovation, I will accept it. It says, new product or process that creates value. And value is um, actually depending on who is looking at it. From a UN perspective, value can be, you know, end of starvation, scrapping metals, sustainability. We have the nice SDG goals. That could be value. If we solve those, that's a tremendous value. If you're a private investor, Value is then monetary. In most terms, then we're talking commercialization and scalability so that you can meet your market needs and project a profit. Now, everybody in here have heard the company Uber? Yeah. So, in the beginning, the guy who have the best definition on the word disruptive it's a guy called Christensen. He's a professor at Harvard. He thought that Uber is not disruptive. 
And why not? Well, the reason behind that is that there's been online booking systems for taxi and cabs for a long time. It wasn't anything new. And basically, he was just being a predator, Travis, who founded the company, on lack of regulation online. And then that became the competitive edge. No taxi license, no taxi insurance, no regulation. And that actually became the competitive edge. Uh, three years later, Christensen changed his mind. And now he decided that actually the process behind Uber is disruptive. And there is a logical explanation to that too, because basically what you do is that you're pooling something. You're pooling a need. And you're pooling a uh, demand and a supply. And you're using digitalization to do so. And the Uber model have been used in other industries as well. So in that sense, yes, the process of Uber is disruptive. The question is then just, is Uber the ones who was first in with that process? Maybe not. Now, every country in the world, like we already said, are supporting innovation. And they do that through universities. They do that for small and medium-sized enterprise parks, incubators, grants, soft loans collaboration, uh, deductions, super deductions, and direct investment. Now, if we look at the triadic patent, and that's basically Japanese, EU, and American patents. So if you have a good idea, the notion is that if it's good enough, you will actually register the patent in those three countries, or those three markets. You see, in 2006, there is a big drop. And why is that? Another thing that we can see is that in countries such as the UK, where they have 250% super deductions for investments in R&D and innovation, they don't even score on this chart. The UK is not even on it. So why is there no impact? If the government is spending billions of pounds, where does that money go? Or is it just the taxpayer is being ripped off? So in 2006, what happened? Well, one explanation for this drop is that the definition slided. The definition on the word innovation has moved from innovation height into scalability and commercialization. So basically, the government started to adapt the investor criteria when selecting companies and ideas to support. Hence, a drop in innovation height. So if we look at some countries, like the UK, so we have super deductions, 250% for this small and medium-sized enterprise. The thing is just that the UK rewrote the definition of SMEs so that it now includes fairly large companies as well. They have government-funded research, which means that most of the research done in universities is funded by taxpayers. And if you buy a patent or research from a university, you can deduct 65% of that cost. And that can then be ad adapted to the super deduction if you're an SME. And then suddenly it becomes almost like profitable to buy research. And yet, they only spend 1.7% of, of the GDP on R&D. And as we could see on the triadic patents, no real results. But one thing is, medical industry, for example, if you have a British medical company, they buy research that is funded by the government and then they deduct the purchase price, then they, where do they register the patents? Well, like most medical companies, they register the patents in Switzerland. Because there you don't pay any tax on it. And what do they do then? Well, then they charge a ridiculous amount of money to the consumer who needs the medicine. You have one company called Novartis, for example, they did that. Half a million dollars for one treatment for one kid with cancer. Taxpayer basically got ripped off three or four times on that one. Sweden, they have 250 million US dollar per year in direct investment to the ecosystem. And 3.3% of the GDP goes to R&D. Early stage funding in Sweden has gone up to about 85% now. It's government money. The VCs were backing down early stage money and the governments increase their spendings. Now, 
all the incubators and science parks in Sweden tend to have an entrepreneur focus, hence not innovation height. In 2015, when you interviewed the incubator managers, the vast majority, above 80%, stated that they were avoiding anything disruptive. Most of the time, the answer why was that it's too resource demanding, and that's true. In 2017, the same questions to the same incubators. Everybody were saying they want disruptive ideas. But then if you dig a little bit deeper and you look at the companies that are actually sitting in the incubators, you find nothing. You find e-mopeds, basically. Design rather than innovation height. Now if we go to Japan, Japan works with an up to 17% R&D deduction for companies, SMEs, 12% for large MNCs, and 3.1% of GDP spendings on R&D. The interesting thing with Japan is that you have collaboration credits, and we will come to that later, but it is interesting. Uh, and what that means is that the government is supporting PPPs, private-public partnerships. So that if a university, together with a company, do research, a larger amount gets deductible. And we can see a little bit of that here. If we look at the spendings per country, from the government perspective, Japan is not in top. It's Russia. Uh, if we look at Japan specifically over the period 2000 to 2014, you can see that it, the spendings dip a little bit in 2006. And then it goes back up again around 2013. No, 2011, sorry. And if we look at the global data for R&D spendings, we can see that Japan is pretty straight-lined, around 3%. You can see United Kingdom there in red, and you see the average in black. And if you look at the fastest climber, that's actually South Korea, which is now hitting about 4.4% in spendings. So if we look at the triadic patents for Japan, we can see that it's following the average curve for OECD. You see United Kingdom there in red. No real payback for the 250% deductions they're giving. In Japan, you see a dip in 2006, which correlates basically to the spendings going down from the government side. And if we continue to look, you can see that Korea is, this is an EU perspective. And according to the EU index, Korea is the highest innovative country at the moment. Japan is third, and EU is the blue line. If we look at EU specifically, you have the three Scandinavian countries in top. And that is also quite interesting, because many times you hear the word, you need to cut the tax so that innovation will come. I will not innovate in your country because your taxes are too high. Scandinavian countries have one thing in common, we have very high tax. And yet we outperform every country, including the UK, with their super deductions. So if we compare Japan to South Korea over the time 2010 to 2017, we can see that one interesting number for Japan is that you see the innovation collaboration goes up. And one reason for that is that the government reintroduced the spendings for that like we said, around 2011. We see that the number of PhDs are dropping slightly, but we see that the patent applications are going up. Uh, but more interestingly here is the trademark applications, because there you don't really have any innovation height, but suddenly trademarking your ideas has become a real success factor. So why is this important? Well, it's important from many perspectives. If we look at governments in the form of large corporations, we can actually translate what we just looked into data that we can use when we are analyzing companies such as Rakuten or organizations such as the United Nations. Most countries are not innovative. We spend a lot of tax money. We don't get any returns on it because we listen too much to the private sector. Same goes for the UN. Same goes for companies of, of size. You can look at a company like one, I've, I was looking for an example for this uh, event today, and I found one successful new product implementation from a large company, and that is Google Maps, which is pretty far from a search engine. 
but basically they succeeded in actually capturing that market. And if you look at another example, also Google, they were actually larger with their invite-only social network service than Facebook until 2010. They had a system called Orkut, but then they dropped it in 2010 and suddenly my Facebook got a lot of new users. So you see that there is a discrepancy between actually market understanding, market penetration, and implementation of new ideas in existing structures. It's a problem. So there are different ways that large corporations actually innovate. In-house innovation, basically listen to your employees. Suggestion box was the old system. You know, an employee has an idea, he puts it on a note and throws it into the mailbox. Sometimes he gets lucky and he, you know, win a chicken. You have external in-house innovation. That's basically if you have a team of people scanning the horizon, as we like to say in the UN, for new ideas being used elsewhere. And if it's a good idea, we try to implement it in our company. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. These days, most large companies and organizations such as the UN were jumping happily at the word of blockchain, for example. Blockchain will end the world starvation. Blockchain will do this. Oh my God, smart e-contracts. Jeez, that's really good because that means it's safe. The notion of a contract is that you have two people in an agreement, right? If you don't agree, contract or not, doesn't really matter. It's not going to work out. It's like a marriage. So what does it matter then if the paper itself is safe or not? In my view, not really. It doesn't matter at all. AI, we will come back to AI a little bit later, but I mean, that can only go two ways. We already have smart bombs. We have pr predator uh, drones that have on board AI. So yeah, that might end civilization as we know it. And if it doesn't, and we, let's say, apply Asimov's three rules. Anyone here read Asimov? Asimov was a Russian writer, science fiction. He came up with the three laws in robotics. A robot shall not harm humans. A robot shall obey humans unless it conflicts with the first law. A robot should protect itself unless it conflicts with the first law. Now, if we look at the world today, we are pretty far from perfection. So if we did apply those three laws to AI, it's a high likelihood that the robots will just you know, confine us to our rooms, like we do with kids when they're being bad. So either way, with Asimov's law or not, you know, AI will just lead to our extinction. So if we then look at the application of these beautiful new technologies in a setting as the UN or in a large corporation, we don't really know what we're doing. And that's a problem. Neither of these will solve all the problems we have. And we have a lot of problems. Now, the UN is specially equipped to do one thing, in my view, and that is that we are very, very good at identifying problems on the ground because we are present in so many countries. We see the problems every day. It doesn't mean that we are the best innovators, but we are really good to define problems. And then people like you here in the room are probably better equipped in helping us solve those problems. And that's something where we now, as the United Nations, are reaching out. And you will see an increase in our outreach, both to the private entities such as Rakuten, Microsoft, and whatever else, but also to individuals with ideas how to fix problems. So back to the larger organizations. So there are challenges, like I now mentioned. We at the UN, we face them every day. Large corporations do too. But we have the problems. We have the silos. We have the different departments, and they don't really like to talk to each other. No, no, this is my territory, please don't touch it. And that's also similar in a large organization as it is to a large corporation. And hence, we're stuck with incremental, we're stuck with copy and paste ideas, and we're stuck with change management. We don't really see innovation happening in large organizations or large companies. In Japan, it's very popular for companies to recruit people with good ideas and research and then shelf the idea and get the guy or girl to work. So that means that in Japan you have tons of patents stuck away 
Some might actually solve some of the critical problems we're looking at, but they're stuck away in some filing system inside the large corporations as Mitsubishi, Toyota, and all the others. That needs to change. So problem definition we talked about. What are we solving? For who are we solving the problem? This is critical questions. If you have an idea and you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to be innovative, you need to identify who you are solving the problem for. So apparently I'm speaking slow today. Only 2% of the people in the world, in the developed world, start companies. Less than 10% of these companies are started by women. That's kind of sad numbers. So are we doomed? 12 years left. All the rich people are building spaceships. I can't afford that, so I actually bought a sailboat. Asimov's three laws on AI will indefinitely lead to this. But I am hopeful, because everyone here in the room will help us solve the problems we're facing. If we can agree on a definition on the word, that will fix a lot of the problems. Thank you.